Hi, this is Bird Guy again, and uh, just want to thank you for showing up. I got um, a couple of emails, people wanting to get questions answered, and I got one from Federico, who says, uh, Hi, I enjoyed Matthew's Bird Guy video last week and look forward to more videos like this. Well, thanks, Federico. That I appreciate that. Glad you enjoyed it. Um, he has two questions, and the first, we'll take them one at a time. The first one says, about a month ago, I recorded a crow in Sanborn Park, making this hoot-like sound. I know crows have lots of vocalizations, but this seemed unusual, and I couldn't figure out any behavior associated with it. Although there are other crows around, this one was not interacting with any of them. So, there you go. Now I'm going to play that call for you. I'm going to try to play it over the video section here, but we'll, we'll play it again later on so you can hear it. Um, well, congratulations, Federico, because you, you've heard something pretty special. Corvids are famous for the uh, variety of calls that they can make, and um, I've heard on many occasions crows, ravens, jays of all kinds uh, do uh, peculiar, unexpected, unexpectedly beautiful sounds. Some of them kind of whistled um, almost like a whisper song. In fact, if you do a Google search for whisper song of jays and crows on uh, YouTube, you'll find some videos about that and you'll hear some examples, particularly the blue jay. But I've heard it with scrub jays and crows and ravens as well. And um, these sounds are usually really, really soft and they don't carry very far Crows and uh, ravens, of course, have a really far carrying call, can be heard sometimes uh, half a kilometer away. Uh, it's quite a distance, maybe more. And uh, the whisper song is really just for sort of intimate situations when, when family members or uh, partners are quite close and they'll engage in these peculiar, unexpected, very soft, gentle sounds. So we'll play that and um, see what you think. So I should probably point out that uh, this wonderful book, The uh, Sibley Guide to Bird Life and Behavior, had quite a bit to say about uh, corvid vocalizations, including the whisper song. Um, and uh, birds of, uh, birdsoftheworld.org, the, the Cornell site, also had quite a bit to say. In fact, it described something in the neighborhood of 20 or so different kinds of vocalizations that crows and ravens use. Most of them just variations on the uh, familiar caw sound or croak sound of the raven. But um, in Death Valley, for example, on a trip that Kelly and I took there, uh, we were hearing ravens do some remarkable rattles and clucks and gurgles that um, it's just kind of, it's a testament of how uh, how skilled the, the corvids are, even though we don't really associate them with song. They have incredible vocal abilities, and it, it's pretty remarkable. So anyway, that's a wonderful book, good source for information, as well as uh, all about birds or uh, birdsoftheworld.org. Uh, well, darn it anyway, uh, I recorded like a really good segment on the next question and uh, somehow it just imploded, so I've got to do it again. But <laughs> it's about Federico's second question. I knew uh, eventually I was going to get a question about gulls, and that makes me pretty happy because I'm a gullophile, a larophile. <laughs> They're fun, they're hard, they're complex, they're subtle. They're all the things that I think make uh, birding a real challenge and, and real rewarding. Anyway, so this is a good time to talk about gulls because we actually have got fewer to consider right now. A lot of the winter gulls are have either left or they're going to leave soon. And we're left with um, large numbers of California gulls a few lingering uh, ringbills, uh, an occasional western, and only one of these breeds commonly here, and that would be the California gull. So in the same way that when you see a Budio outside, you kind of want to assume that it's a red-tailed hawk, a red-tailed uh, at first, because that's the most common Budio that we've got here. Of course, we have red-shouldered and Swainsons and others pass through, but... Um, the most common one is red tail, clearly. So 
your job as a birder would be to eliminate red-tailed hawk as quickly as possible uh, and in order to identify something less common like Swainson's. <clears throat> um, and the gulls are the same way. The default gull here should probably be thought uh, of as California gull. So when you look at gull, uh, lots and lots of gulls in Alviso or the Palo Alto Duck Pond, etc. Just assume for the for the moment that they're California gulls, and then do what you can by looking at them to eliminate the California gull in, in order to arrive at a ringbill or or glaucous winged or something else. <clears throat> um, structure is hugely important when identifying gulls, and and I'll talk about that in in more detail later on. <clears throat> but his first question, Federico's question about gulls is this. He, he wanted something on gull basics. Is there an easy way to distinguish between a flying adult California gull and a ring-billed gull from underneath? Um, he goes on to say, I know the beak marks are the key, but most times it's very hard to see the beak when they are flying directly overhead. So, great. Thanks for that question. Um, I took the liberty of drawing a little picture and I'll show it to you right here. So what I'm trying to do here is show, just in its simplest form, the features that I look at to distinguish ringbill from California gull uh, when they're flying overhead. So here we're looking at the ventral surface of the wings. That's the underside. And you see on the, on the left is ring-billed gull, and on the right, California. And let's see if I can figure this out here. Do you see the kind of crescent shape? If you're familiar with... Uh, Star Trek, you'll recognize this shape as the insignia that the uniforms, the people in the cast of the Star Trek uh, have on their uniforms. It's, a, it's an interesting kind of interesting um, crescent shape, like a Nike logo almost, or a swoosh, or a, maybe a boomerang. But that's pretty much the way um, a ringbill in flight going overhead looks the black area here whereas you see the california gull has much more of a much more black for one thing and it's kind of a broad wedge shaped um so that's an important difference you'll see also that the ring-billed gull is a bit paler in its adult form than the uh, california i think uh, but this is pretty subtle and um may not be so obvious there's also a a, a difference between the wing shape. California gulls, to me, look like they have longer fingers. So this part of the wing seems longer and more pointed to me than the uh, the ring-billed gull. And I think a lot of people say that California gulls look long-winged. So as an adult, I would look at the black, the amount of black you're, you're seeing. Um, Possibly the wing shape, possibly the darkness, but it's really this black area here that I think is most useful. Well, that's the ventral surface. The dorsal surface is different too. And here's, a, here's another little picture. <clears throat> and you see uh, the ring build again on the left and the California on the right. Now, the, wi the wingtip coloration, the, depth, the black on the wingtip, it is pretty clear. We see the crescent again, that boomerang shape, the swoosh, the, the Nike logo on the uh, ring-billed gull. And we see something more of a acute triangle on the California gull on the right. But also look at how the um, ring-bill is fairly pale and the ring-bill is just slightly darker. Again, this is pretty subtle, but there is a difference in that gray tone on the back. Uh, so I would say consider the lightness of your bird. If you see a very light bird, chances are it's going to be a ring a, a ring bill. And it could also, if it's wintertime, could also be a, a herring gull, because that's quite pale and has limited black on the wings. So I did a, a third drawing, <clears throat> which uh, attempts to show first cycle birds. <clears throat> and all the same things are going on, but they're messier and muddier and browner. Uh, on a first cycle bird. The the ringbill, again, seems to have a little bit less black on the wingtips, has more pale on the wings. It has the dark secondaries. It has a dark wing tip, uh, sorry, tail, tip of the tail. The mantle up here is paler than we see in the California gull. 
uh, which has more black on the wings. And you'll notice this interesting double bar. These are the uh, the the um, greater coverts are edged with darkness, and that on the open wing of the first cycle bird creates this kind of double barred um, impression on the on the bird. <clears throat> Overall, California is quite a bit darker. And a lot of times the, the head is so dark, but the face tends to be really light. So <clears throat> I hope that answers Federico's question about um, just basic IDs distinction of uh, ring billed and California gulls in flight. He asked for the adult. I had to throw in some first cycle because we get a lot of adults and a lot of first cycles, but we don't get very many second or or third cycle uh, Californias. Um, there's an interesting reason for that. Uh, I'll leave it to you to kind of figure that out. We could talk about that later. Anyway, so those are Federico's two questions. And um, I'll come back a bit later with something else. So uh, as promised, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about what it's like to be a bird, David Allen Sibley. Um, I haven't finished reading this. I've just done a little bit more thorough glancing through it and browsing. Um, I'm still reading Love in the Time of Cholera, and that's sort of taking all my time. But um, anyway, this is a wonderful book. It's it's really accessible, and uh, I've, I've come a couple of a few things that I wanted to mention. One is that the uh, the whole opening sequence has pretty good basic information about birds, their lives, their behaviors, etc. This goes on for quite a few pages, and it's a really nice, broad view of, of bird life, behavior, evolution, um, the development of feathers, flight, um, swimming, things of that sort. So it's, uh, it's quite nice, and each bullet point in this section leads you to a, a species in the book elsewhere to kind of provide some more details about that topic, whatever it happens to be. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is that all the large illustrations um, on the left-hand side are large because they're life-size. So <laughs> that's especially fun uh, just to, it, it explains why some of the images look so large. Um, but yeah, they're life size, so that's uh, that's quite cool. But there are also some insects here talking about the adaptations of feathers and cormorants and their eyesight um, and uh, any number of other details. But it doesn't really cover the entire bird. It's it's a uh, David is taking bits and pieces that he finds especially interesting and. Uh, it is interesting. It's it's wonderful to, to browse through. It's not a book that you read cover to cover. It's something more you sit and enjoy a few pages at a time, or when you have a particular question about, well, for example, pelicans and, and what happens when they're diving. <clears throat> so that's quite, quite cool. Um, here's another one with an especially large image, sandhill cranes. And here you can see that he's made um, a comparison with the leg bones of humans. He talks a little bit about the, the dance over here. So I'm really enjoying it. I like it very much. But I thought I would take this opportunity to tell you a couple of other books that I really like, um, some of which are expensive and some are not. But The Bird Watcher's Companion, Christopher Leahy, is especially good. I think this is a, a um, pretty dense sort of encyclopedia about bird behavior, bird anatomy. Uh, it's filled with images. Um, and uh, for example, if you want to look up something about plumage or uh, courtship displays or mating systems or uh, genetic um, research. So the book covers many, many things, uh, even as far as um, ornithologist through history. So you can find a lot of information there. And in occasion, uh, Christopher Leahy is quite funny. So I enjoy that book very much. There's um, there's the classic ornithology, Frank Gill. I think this is now has a third or even possibly a fourth edition. 
This is the second edition. This is like a college textbook, so it's got a lot of information. It's quite dense, but it's really, really good, really thorough. <clears throat> Much more recently, the uh, Cornell Lab produced the Handbook of Bird Biology, which again is a college level textbook. Uh, this one is different from Frank Gill's book in that it's filled with color images, graphs and charts, uh, and newer information actually. So I highly recommend this one as well. This is quite expensive. You can get it through Cornell. This one you can often find um, um, at uh, used bookstores or used on Amazon Marketplace. <clears throat> Same with Birdwatcher, the Birdwatcher's Companion. You can, I think we've even got uh, a copy at the ranch, but um, all quite good and, and available um, in various places. This I got through Amazon and um, I think it was $35. So it's still an expensive book, but pretty wonderful. And I'm really enjoying it. I think it's suitable for um, not only adults, but for, for young folks as well, uh, because it is so accessible and um, adults will enjoy it because it, it does have the, um, the scientific information in there as well, but on a really uh, digestible uh, level. So that's, uh, that's the book review for this portion of uh, Ask Bird Guy. We'll see you next week.